I'll just say a few more words about uh, Dr. Fox. He is a, a luminary in the field of creation spirituality. He has studied this. His book, Original Blessing, it was a tremendous contribution to the whole field. Of, but he's continued to publish over 40 books uh, in the last 40 years. Uh, he has studied many, many of the great mystics in both the Christian tradition and other traditions. He's written extensively on the new science and cosmology. He's, uh, as, we, as he brought out, he was a close friend of Don B. Griffith, one of the great spiritual uh, figures in India. So his influence has been worldwide. He has created the field of creation spirituality for the next century. And uh, also uh, he has, contributed new forms of spirituality for uh, when he was at the uh, parliament, his uh, program on, I forget what you call it now, the mass that you did, the cosmic the mass. Cosmic mass. Cosmic, cosmic mass. mass is a new form of expression of spirituality, which was very well attended and uh, was a beautiful program that he uh, had there at the parliament. So we're very happy to have him as part of our a GMU uh, program. He's uh, sponsoring a student from Sri Lanka to study with GMU and in creation spirituality. So we're excited to have him. Those of you who are joining for the first time, uh, GMU sponsors a program in religion and science with Father Pam Plante, whom you see on screen. It's a two-year program in religion and science, and we have many people from India and Africa studying with us on scholarship. If any of you wish to join this program in the next cohort, which will be next summer, you, should, you can contact uh, Mary Akke, who's our ma communications manager. I think she's on this uh, at the GMU site. So uh, it's a wonderful program with scholars from India, Africa, and the United States, and students from all over the world. So we're a global university exploring the new spirituality, and we're very happy to have Dr. Fox with us today. Uh, he'll be lecturing now for the next hour. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Thank you, Gerald. <clears throat> Thank you for your vision uh, with GMU and making this uh, kind of um, gathering possible, thanks to the new technology and what Father Pierre Chardin called the noosphere, which is humanity's capacity to create a web of conversation and interaction uh, around the world, which has literally come true since he died in 1955. I want to thank Father Pamplani too for inviting me into his course. And uh, I look forward to our, our experience this morning. So I was asked to talk about creation spirituality and science. And I am not a scientist. I want to begin that way. But it has been my pleasure to work with a lot of scientists. Um, I originally began my school, the Institute of Culture and Creation Spirituality, ICCS, we call it, at Mundelein College in Chicago. And I was part of the Chicago-based uh, Dominican order then. And um, the school flourished for seven years, but then... Brian Swim joined my faculty. Brian Swim is a physicist and cosmologist. And uh, together we met Thomas Berry and invited him to come and lecture at our school. And he has spent his life studying science as well as indigenous traditions and Chinese traditions. And um, Brian said, you know, the real dialogue between mysticism and science is not happening in Chicago. It's happening in the Bay Area. One out of four scientists in America live in the Bay Area. So to make a long story short, we moved our program to Oakland, California, where I've lived for 34 years. And now I'm living north of Oakland, about 40 minutes up north. And um, so working with Brian Swim, a cosmologist, with Thomas Berry, who's done a lot of work on today's science and creation story, uh, but also a number of other scientists, including Rupert Sheldrake, with whom I've written two books, and um, um, 
others who live here in the Bay Area, this has been a great blessing to me. And um, it's raised a lot of uh, insights uh, for me about um, relationship of spirituality and, and science. Now, creation spirituality, obviously, is about science because it's about creation. And what do scientists do if, if not study nature and study creation? Now, I received that name, nomenclature, creation spirituality, from my mentor, Father Père Chenu, C-H-E-N-U, a French Dominican with whom I studied in 1968 in Paris at the Institut Catholique there, which is where I, I received my, my degree. It was his last year teaching. He was 76 years old, spring of 1968. And it was a, a glorious moment when he pointed out in class the difference between creation spirituality that begins with creation and the fall redemption tradition in Christianity that begins with sin. Problem with beginning with sin, folks, is that sin is only 200,000 years old or as old as our species. Creation is 13.8 billion years old. Why would we begin with the human? And look where that has taken us. It's taken us to this moment of peril for Mother Earth, peril for millions of species on Mother Earth, and peril for our own species. So when you begin with the human, you're, uh, you're in trouble, and you make trouble. And we're paying the bill now, our generation, the future generations. The, the receipt is coming in, in terms of climate change, in terms of the acidity of the oceans, in terms of the rising of the seas and the melting of the um, uh, of the uh, of so much um gifts that we have from which we get our water from the mountains you see the glaciers in the mountains from africa to um nepal and so forth uh all these are melting i have a friend who's native american on his 50th birthday he treated himself to go to africa and climb mount kilimanjaro that's what he did on his 50th birthday and when he got to the top he cried because you could see how the glaciers are melting right before our eyes. And as any human who's awake realizes, this is where we get so much of our water, not just in Africa, but of course in Asia too. So much of it is, comes from the glaciers of the Himalayas and so forth. So everywhere, this is the, we have a lot of wars going now, but the ultimate war is a war against Mother Earth. And we should call it what it is. It is matricide. It is the killing of the mother, matricide. It is ecocide. It is the killing of our relationships with all other species, including the forests, including the soil, including the waters, the rivers, the lakes, the oceans, and all the other species that of course, depend on these realities. So this, this is the dire moment in which we gather. On the other hand, it is also hope. Why? Because my experience is that humans, they say necessity is the mother of invention, that humans tend to be self-satisfied until there's an emergency. And when we're self-satisfied, we're at each other's throats. We make war with one another out of ideology or religion or what have you. And um, I have a brother right now who lives in Iceland. He's married to an Icelandic woman. And, of course, they're going through this tremendous experience of lava underneath their, their feet, heating up. And he wrote a letter the other day about it. And his wife said, you know, Finally, we're not bickering with one another in Iceland. We're trying to help one another. It's bringing the best out of us. So this is what emergency does, folks. It brings the best out of us. So it's not a time for despair. It's a time for rolling up our sleeves and going to work. And that is where ecumenism comes in, because people of all religions and none 
are going to be equally affected when Mother Earth is under the the um, pressure that it's under today. So this can bring our species together. Not only this, but also the new story from science that um, that we have a new creation story. And it, it does not mean we have to throw out our individual creation stories, whether it's from the Quran or from Genesis or from any other source. All peoples, all tribes have their creation stories, and there's wisdom in all of them. You don't have to take them scientifically, literally, but they all have wisdom. This is one of my favorite creation stories from the Apache people, the native one tribe in America. It's, it's very brief. First, God created the dog. The dog was lonely. So then God created humans. That's one of the Apache creation stories. And I love it because it puts humans in our place, that we're here to befriend the dog. So it just brings us down a notch, be a little more humble. So there's wisdom in every creation story. Now, we don't have to take the story literally. But there's wisdom in it. There's wisdom in all creation stories. So we can celebrate all our creation stories on the one hand, at the same time that we tune in to the new creation story from science that is telling us that our universe is 13.8 billion years old and that it all began smaller than a zygote. And so the proper model for the universe is not a machine, which dominated in science and culture for centuries, no, it's not a machine. It, the proper analogy is an organism. The universe is a whole. And it is growing. It's expanding. And just two summers ago, we learned the universe is two trillion galaxies big, each with hundreds, billions of stars. Now, that information alone is a profoundly spiritual fact. Why? Because it awakens wonder and awe. Just two weeks ago, I was giving a lecture in a Unitarian Universalist church of whom there were atheists present. And um, I told the story how uh, previously I had been at a conference um, online in, and um, I had mentioned this creation story, and afterwards, a fellow in our small group said to me, he said, I'm an atheist, but when I heard you talk about two trillion galaxies, he said, that really taught me some humility. And he said, whoever's responsible for these two trillion galaxies, I better try to get to know better. He said, I'm not an atheist anymore. The awe and wonder can truly initiate. It, this is what initiates our spiritual lives. The via positiva is what the mystics, mystics call it. Let me share with you a, um, a few teachings about relation between awe and wonder. You see, what I'm saying is this. Scientists first, sci science's first contribution today is to awaken to reawaken our awe and our wonder. Think of the Webb telescope, how it is beaming in to our computers and our television sets, even our iPhones, the pictures, the stories, the wonder, the vastness, the beauty of our universe. And Nesta Cardinal says, we can argue about the purpose of the universe, the meaning of the universe. We cannot argue about the beauty of the universe. Science is bringing us together, thanks to technology, at this very moment, literally, to learn from one another. To share our common awe and wonder. And with awe and wonder comes reverence. And with reverence comes thanks, thanksgiving. These are the energies of the Via Positiva, of the mystics. And this is what is coming our way by way of science today. This is a, a remarriage, a new marriage of science and spirituality. And they need each other. 
David Bohm, the physicist, now deceased, late 20th century physicist, said, science is not enough. Science is not enough. And um, Albert Einstein said, the most important function of art and science, the most important function of art and science, says Albert Einstein, is to awaken the cosmic religious feeling and keep it alive. Well, today's science can do that for us. The new creation story and other elements of today's science, which I will be bringing up as I move along in this, in this presentation. But I want to share with you just a few of the teachings about that go deeper into why cosmology is so primal in our spirituality. Rabbi Heschel says, wonder is an act in which the mind confronts the universe. Wonder is an act in which the mind confronts the universe. So we are made for wonder. In the biblical tradition, awe is a beginning of wisdom. Wisdom is exactly what we're missing in our species today. We've got all this knowledge, all these facts. We have so much knowledge, we have to make computers to store the knowledge. But where is the wisdom? We're destroying the earth with all of our knowledge, and we're threatening it. We can tear down a rainforest in a day that it takes God and nature 10,000 years to give birth to. And when a rainforest dies, it's extinct. It does not come back. Rainforest is a once-in-a-universe event. I've written about the cosmic Christ because the cosmic Christ is the archetype in Christianity which goes all the way back to Paul, is the, the first writer in Christian Bible, writes about the cosmic Christ. In Colossians, for example, Colossians 1, about Christ holds all things together in the heavens and the earth. Now that archetype has another name in Buddhism, it's called the Buddha nature. Same idea. And in Judaism, it's called Selem, T-S-E-L-E-M, which is the image of God which is in all beings, including the universe itself. Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, whom I follow closely because he, he had the courage in the 13th century to step out of the fundamentalist and narrow Christianity of the time, which was all about sin and redemption, and to bring in a scientist, Aristotle. And Aristotle came to the West through Islam. In Baghdad, they were translating Aristotle into Latin for the West, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They had teams going, translating Aristotle. And Aristotle was, of course, a pagan, not from the biblical tradition. And this was a very scary thing to the fundamentalists of Aquinas' day. What is this priest, theologian doing, translating a pagan scientist? Who needs science? We have all of our answers in the Bible. No, we don't. No, we don't. Aquinas said, Revelation comes in two volumes, nature and the Bible. Nature and the Bible. And this is why we need scientists. Scientists study nature. He said, a mistake about nature results in a mistake about God. A mistake about nature in nature, about nature, results in a mistake about God. And that's why we need scientists. You get nature right. Sometimes they get it right. They don't always get it right. They're human too. For centuries, they told us the universe was a machine, which it certainly is not. It's more like a maternity bed. There is a star being born every 15 seconds out there, folks. Father Sky is more alive than he's ever been. But for several hundred years, the West was told 
The universe is a machine. We shut it down. As Brian Swim says, we were taught that matter was dead and inert. But the biggest news of the postmodern science is that matter is alive. And the earth is alive. The universe is alive. It's alive insofar as it is birthing. It's dying, resurrecting. It's really the pattern that Christianity names as the Paschal mystery, life, death, and resurrection. This is happening to supernovas. It's happening to stars and to planets and galaxies. The whole universe is involved in this mystery of life, death, and resurrection. Rebirth. So, because a Christ archetype is so important, or the Buddha nature archetype, or the image of God archetype, the names are not important. We, the names, we can make idols of, of language and names. We should be careful. Naming is very important. It's what poets are for. That's what scriptures are for. Scriptures are written by many poets. But we don't want to get stuck on the letter. As Paul says, a letter kills. Spirit gives life. When I meet with scientists, and it's been my honor to meet many scientists in my life, I, I like to ask them this one question. When did you know you wanted to be a scientist? In other words, when did your vocation come to you? Under what circumstances? So far, 100%, 100% have said this. First, they stop and they say, they scratch their heads and say, I haven't thought about that for years. Then they're silent for a while. And this is what they say. Like This happened with Rupert Sheldrake, British biologist, when I first met him. And he paused and he said, I haven't thought about this in years. He said, I fell in love with a bush plant it was a bush when I was five years old. My father was a naturalist. He took me into, the, into nature often. And he introduced me to this plant. And then Rupert said, oh, my God, I never thought of this. I did my doctoral thesis on that plant. <laughs> so he fell in love with his five, did his doctoral thesis on it. Then he moved to India and continued to work with that plant. Every single scientist I've met, have said the same story. One woman scientist said, oh, she said, I fell in love with this worm when I was six years old. Another said, I fell in love with a star when I was six years old. It's a love affair. We shouldn't just talk about science and religion or science and spirituality. We should talk about scientists and spirituality. Because scientists are human beings first. And they fall in love. And that's the origin of most of their vocations. That's the via positiva, folks, of the mystical path of the creation spiritual tradition. First, we fall in love. We're here to fall in love with creation. Creation birthed us. Now, Father Pierre Chenu, whom I told you named the creation spiritual tradition for me, he has a lot to say. He was a scholar of Thomas Aquinas. He was a great historian, studied Aquinas in great depth and breadth. And he studied the 12th century Renaissance in Europe, which was a great awakening. It was when the divine feminine came back in the 12th century, and it gave birth to all these cathedrals. Everyone, 500 of them, named after Mary, the divine feminine in Christianity. Notre Dame de Paris, Our Lady of Paris, Notre Dame de Chartres, Notre Dame de Lyon, goes on and on. A great awakening of the feminine occurred in the 12th century, and it's evident in the architecture that moved from the defensive and squat and thick-walled, small-windowed Romanesque architecture of the Dark Ages to the, the height and the light and the colored windows affected by the sun so profoundly, the 12th and 13th century Renaissance in architecture. Here is what Chenu says. 
all of nature belongs to secular science, but all of nature is sacred as well. It is merely one's perspective that changes, and science and mysticism ought naturally to complement one another. Science and mysticism ought naturally to complement one another. The perspective changes. And remember, Einstein talked about that. First purpose of science and art is to awaken the cosmic religious feeling and keep it going. So we need science and religion to be together again. They were divorced in the 15th century when the bubonic plague came. And um, there was this rupture in the West, in Europe, because up to then, these great mystics like Hildegard of Bingen, Francis of Assisi, Thomas Aquinas, Meister Eckhart, they believed in and practiced and encouraged others to do the sacredness of nature. But when the bubonic plague hit, which is not unlike our recent plague, but they didn't have science to deal with it, they didn't have vaccines, they didn't understand its origins, there was suspicion and guilt that arose. And people were around saying, well, it's my sins that have brought about the, um, the rupture in nature, this bubonic plague thing. But one woman stood out. She's over my shoulder here. Her name is Julian of Norwich. Norwich is a town in England. And she wrote a powerful book. Excuse me. <laughs> and, um, uh, oh, I guess I don't have it with me here. But the, the picture on, on the cover of the book is behind me here. And um, she's, she tells us about a, a vision that she had where she saw a small ball in her palm of her hand the size of a hazelnut, and it was glowing. And she said, what is this? And the answer she got was, this is everything that exists. Everything that exists. You see the whole cosmos. And she said, but it's so fragile, it could easily fall apart. And she got another answer that said, God's love keeps it all together. God's love keeps it all together. So that's what is painted here in uh, the cover of my book of Julian. Because it's a tremendous statement about the sacredness of the universe, about the cosmic Christ. She had that profound experience. And she lived through the worst pandemic ever in Europe, the bubonic plague, where others were going crazy and blaming it on their sins. And blaming it on Jews, anti-Semitism rose, blaming it on heretics. No, it was a it was a virus. But that's just an example. And by the way, the book that's open in this cover picture too is says on it, God is mother. Because she developed the idea of the motherhood of God more profoundly, more deeply than anyone in Western history. Anyone up until the very late 20th century. Julie of Norwich, 14th century. A cosmic consciousness, the sacredness of the cosmos, and the divine feminine, a place for both. But the rest of Western religion went down that rabbit hole where they almost threw out creation as an important element of faith and brought in redemption as the first thing. The redemption is not the first thing. Creation is the first thing. Check your Bible. Genesis 1 doesn't mention sin or evil. It's about original blessing. Blessing is a theological word for goodness. And so it's a cosmology. It's a story of how we got here. Now, it's not identical to today's science story, but it has a lot in common. One thing, it begins with light. Creation begins with light. And after all these creations, we're told it's good. The light is good. The forests are good. The plants are good. The animals are good. 
and humans come last, which is exactly what today's crazy story from science is telling us. We're the last. With the end of the story, at least for now. And when humans come, the whole creation is called for the first time very good. We bring goodness in to creation. And all together, the entire circle is very good. That's the first page of our Bible. And that page was lost beginning in the 14th century when creation spirituality was lost. And then in the 17th century, science and religion split entirely. Big blast open in the West. Beginning with the burning of Giordano Bruno at the stake in the year 1600 in Rome. What was Giordano Bruno's sin? He was trying to bring the new science, Copernicus, into Western theology. For that, he was not only burned at the stake, first he was tortured for weeks, they cut his tongue out, and so forth. So this rupture occurred between science and religion, and, of course, then there were 30 years of war as well between the religions in Europe, different versions of Christianity. And scientists said, let's make a truce. You believers, they realize the believers can be pretty fierce. Why don't you take the soul and we'll take the universe? And that's what happened. That um, religion became more and more introspective, more and more about sending redemption exclusively where science went and explored the universe and came up with the powers of the universe in the 20th century, atomic power and all that. And there we are. We have the schizophrenic civilization in the West, which has dominated other religions, set out in the late 15th century to conquer all these indigenous peoples. They didn't talk about creation at all, the sacredness of creation with these people. They just said, are you saved? Are you saved the way we're saved? And we know what happened there, the colonizing, the genocide. Now we're waking up to all this. And now science and religion is more and more on the same path, really. So I want to point out now some of the great gifts from today's science, gifts to spirituality. And of course, um, gifts are returned as well. Um, Parashanu says, the human person is entirely one with the cosmos. Entirely one with the cosmos. Human nature lives in nature. It is a microcosm of nature. The history of nature is not just a minor event in the theater of a spiritual history. That there is continuous creation. Creation is always going on. And there's continuous incarnation. That divinity is always taking on flesh, joining history, and sacralizing matter. That spirit enters history. And in the Christian consciousness, it took on a special form in Jesus, but in fact, it takes on special form in all beings. And that's what the Cosmic Christ tradition is. Christ is the light in all beings. John 1. And now we have from science the datum that there are photons or light waves in every being in the universe and the universe itself began with a fireball with light. Long before there was a sun, there was light. And Genesis 1 says the same thing, actually. First came light and then came the sun, which gave particular light. To us here on Earth. I had a dream years ago that said this. There's nothing wrong with human species today except one thing. You have forgotten the sense of the sacred. You have forgotten the sense of the sacred. That's what the dream said. It was a dream for all of us. Because when we were taught in the modern era, Universe is a machine. Father Sky was shut down. 
everything becomes dead matter and inert. We lose a sense of the sacred. Now, Thomas Berry says, he asks the question, well, how do you get sense of the sacred back? And you get the sense of the sacred back from the universe itself, from a new cosmology. And that is exactly what's happening. He says, Thomas Berry, we will recover our sense of wonder and our sense of the sacred. Notice they are the same thing, wonder and the sacred. Only if we appreciate the universe beyond ourselves as a revelatory experience of that numinous presence whence all things come into being. Indeed, the universe is the primary sacred reality. And we are invited to participate in it. And so much is happening today. Webb Telescope is just one example of how we are being fed a new relationship to the universe. And Paris Chenu points out that the Renaissance of the 12th century, which he calls the greatest Renaissance in the West because it was grassroots and not top down like the 16th century Renaissance, the Renaissance of the 12th century happened because of a new discovery of nature a new perspective on nature. Well, folks, that is exactly what humanity is imbibing together today, a new understanding of nature. Has it come in time to, to bring about our salvation, to get over our petty hatreds and wars and antagonisms? Black Elk is a great Native American teacher, and he said this, we should understand well that all things are the work of the Great Spirit. We should know Great Spirit is within all things, the trees, the grasses, the rivers, the mountains, and the four-legged animals, and the winged peoples. And even more important, we should understand the Great Spirit is above all these things and peoples as well. He comes with the souls of people. He comes within the souls of people when they realize their relationship, their oneness with the universe and all its powers. And when they realize that at the center of the universe dwells Wankan Tanka, the Holy One, at the center of the universe. And this center is really everywhere. It is within each of us. That's postmodern physics, folks. There is no center to this universe. It is everywhere. It is wherever there is depth, wherever there is birthing happening. Resurrection, therefore. This is why the new creation story from science is so primal for humans to wake up and reconnect psyche to cosmos, which is the work of ritual. This is the work of healthy religion. To bring the human psyche connected again to the universe, to the whole. That is where we find peace and reverence and gratitude and the realization that all is sacred. The sacredness that we've lost. The miracle of light. Today's physics tells us, David Bohm says light is frozen matter, frozen matter. Other physicists will say, well, light is very slow moving matter. But the miracle is that they're saying light and matter are the same thing. Why is that? I call that a miracle or a mark. Because if you look at the world religions, the most common synonym for divinity is light. You find it everywhere. It's in the Quran. It's in the 99 most beautiful names for God in the wonderful Islamic practice that God is light. Well, of course, it's, in, it's the first thing created in Genesis 1. And, of course, Christ is said to say, I am the light of the world. And we are all lights. Don't hide your light under a bushel basket, etc. And, of course, the Buddha says, that um, we are all carrying light and enlightenment within us. Be a, be a lamp unto yourself, says Buddha. 
it's a very, the Celtics have it, African traditions have it. Light is so special. But now we're told there's no dualism between light and matter. It's the same thing in different form. That is so important because it resacralizes matter. We get over the dualism that has dominated so much Western thought for so long. So we already have two gifts from science. One is a new awakening to cosmology, which is what creation is, the universe, existence, everything that is. Meister Eckhart, the great 14th century mystic, was also a Dominican like Aquinas. He says, isness is God. Isness is God. That existence itself is the miracle. Rilke. Early 20th century poets said that too. Existence is the miracle. You can't take existence for granted. <clears throat> now, another gift from uh, today's science is Names of God. Names of God. The Muslim tradition has a beautiful practice called the 99 Most Beautiful Names of God. And I practice that frequently. You know, I'm a Christian priest. But then after doing it for many years, um, and I would walk down the street walking my dog, and I'd, I would repeat a lot of these names and then run off and make up other names for God. Thomas Aquinas says that every being is a name for God and no being is a name for God. The ancient Vedas in India say that God has a million faces. But Aquinas is saying God has trillions of faces because every being is a name for God. He says that in his commentary on Pseudodenis' book on the divine names. Pseudodenis was a Syrian monk in the 6th century. We wrote about nine names. And, and Aquinas names the 42 names that um, Dennis named, all from the scriptures. The God is stone. God is a rock. God is the dew. God is um, the light. And God is love and so forth. 42 names. Then Aquinas, at the end of his commentary, says, oh, and by the way, every being is a name for God. So you are a name for God. Look in the mirror sometime. These um, musicians, this is Miles Davis, a great African-American musician. It's a wonderful painting, I think, by a young African-American in Oakland. I purchased it from him years ago, but I love it. It depicts the gift of music to the world that Miles Davis gave. And it shows different generations. It shows him when he was an old man and a young man. And of course, the energy of the dancers and everything. I just love that painting. So divinity is constantly manifesting and expressing itself in art, in science, in ritual, in all things. So I wrote a book a few years ago, and I give credit to the Muslim tradition um, in the introduction, but I call it Naming the Unnameable, 89 Wonderful and Useful Names for God, including the unnameable God. So I didn't want to compete with the Muslim tradition, I want to honor it, so I didn't go for 99. I, I stopped at 89. But I just want to share with you a few of the names that come from today's science, because that was delivered on my part. Of course, I begin with Familiar name of God is love is number one. God is goodness. Julian Norwich says God is the goodness in all things. Goodness in all things. And she was saying this during the pandemic, during the bubonic plague, people dying all around her. In Europe, between one out of two and one out of three people died in the bubonic plague. It was that bad. And it was a horrible death. You got it and you were dead within three days. Your whole body turned pus and everything else. 
God is a ground of being. God is a cause of wonder. But here is a definition of God, a name of God, that comes from a scientist, a physicist. God is the mind of the universe. God is the mind of the universe. And uh, this comes from Eric Yonch, who wrote the book, The Self-Organizing Universe, a very influential book, a physicist who taught here at, at Berkeley, at the University of California in Berkeley. And he says, what is mind? Mind is self-organization dynamics at many levels, as a dynamics which itself evolves. In this respect, all natural history is also history of mind. At the end of his book, which, as I say, has been a very influential book in science, self-organization, he says, what I've been talking about up to now, only mystics have talked about God as the self-organizing mind of the universe. But in the synthesis I offer, it becomes part of science, and this comes closer to life. In other words, he's saying, the mystics talked about it, but because I'm a scientist talking about it, it's going to enter life. So that's one example you see of scientists' gift to us today is coming up with new images of the divine. Another is from um, an astrophysicist from Sweden uh, who, who lived in Santa Fe when I met him. He came to a book signing of mine. Uh, Arne Weiler, W-I-L-L-E-R, he calls God the planetary mind field, the planetary mind field. And he says, there's just all kinds of things in creation and nature that could not have happened in the 4.5 billion years of this planet without some kind of intelligence guiding it, such as the invention of the eye. Do the mathematics on it, it's not possible. It would be a, like a, a monkey hyping Shakespeare. Not enough time to get it done. So there is a a mind, a planetary mind, he calls it, that births um, our, our planet. And um, Deepak Chopra, who is a, a doctor and scientist, uh, says God is consciousness. God is consciousness. And another uh, great thinker from Czechoslovakia, and I apologize, I've never been able to pronounce his name. He's a scientist, he in Chicago. It talks about flow. That flow is so primal to the energy of the universe. And uh, one young physicist, I first heard him say this in a talk he gave, he was 41, and he said, for me, God is flow. And of course, God is energy. God is energy. And God as breath. God is life. So these are just a few uh, names that science assists us with today to reimagine and rename what we call God. And we have permission to do that. If, if Thomas Aquinas, a doctor of the church, and a great saint himself, a great mystic himself, dealing with science in his day with Aristotle, and he took a lot of flack for it, the fundamentalists of the 13th century were no more eager to hear about science than the fundamentalists of the 21st century, I can assure you. The problem is really psychological, not theological. It is that people latch on to their version of God and project that, and everything else is outside that. It's, that's what idolatry is, to latch on to one's own projections. That's what idolatry is. We've been given minds. We are this special species with this tremendous capacity to learn and curiosity. Of course, with it, we can do good things and we can do evil things. And that takes us to another gift from science, and that is a gift of interdependence. Today's science names interdependence, interconnectivity, as an absolute basic habit or law of the universe. And what is interdependence? It is the basis of compassion, my friends. This is what all religions are teaching. We're capable of compassion, and compassion is a divine capacity. Thomas Merton, the last talk he ever gave, three hours before his death, a Catholic monk in Bangkok, retreat center near Bangkok, said this. He said, 
Compassion is a keen awareness of the interdependence of all living things that are all part of one another and all involved in one another. That was his last gift to us, his definition of compassion is interdependent. But you see what I'm saying? The Dalai Lama says, we can do away with all religion. We can't do away with compassion. Compassion is my religion. Jesus said in Luke 6, be you compassionate as your creator in heaven is compassionate. The summary of a sermon on the mount. And in the Jewish tradition, which is Jesus' tradition, compassion is the secret name for God. Jesus let the secret out of the bag in Luke 6. And in Islam, the most common used adjective of Allah in the Quran by far is the word Allah, the compassionate one. Furthermore, in the 99 beautiful, most beautiful names for God, compassion, the compassionate one is one of them, along with light and so forth. So this is spirituality and science getting together, folks. When science is finally on board that interdependence runs the universe, that's what compassion is. Meister Eckhart said, what happens to another, whether it be a joy or a sorrow, happens to me. That's compassion, folks. And we know, especially in times like ours, in war, and all this struggle, the heroism of people put compassion first, not their own safety to serve others who put generosity first, who take seriously the admonition to love your neighbor as yourself, including your enemy, because we're capable of it. It's a divine capacity. All the world religions are saying that. They have to say it. They have to keep repeating it because we don't get it. It doesn't come naturally to us. It doesn't come naturally to us. But there it is. And physics is on board now. What a difference that can make if we have the time left to build a civilization, a renaissance, therefore, on compassion, on our interdependence, which is both a scientific truth now and a mystical truth. Interdependence. <clears throat> Another gift from science today is I found it very useful. The naming of our three brains, the naming of our three brains. To know that we have a reptilian brain, which is 420 million years old in all of us. It is about action and reaction. It's very important. It runs our respiratory system, our breathing, and it runs, runs our sexuality. Of course, it's important. But it wants to dominate. Reptiles are real not, not real good at bonding, you know. They're not real good at compromise. When you're wrestling with a crocodile, it's usually win-lose. So that win-lose motif is deeply inside our brains. The second brain is half as old, easy to remember, 210 million years old, our mammal brain. Now, the mammal brain is the kinship brain. It's the brain of mammals who are big on motherhood and fatherhood and kinship and family. Julian's note, God is our mother. And, of course, the word for compassion in both Hebrew and Arabic comes from the word for womb. The womb people are the mammals. That is our mammal brain. So when Jesus comes along or the Buddha comes along or the Dalai Lama comes along or Muhammad comes along and calls us to compassion, they are calling us to assert our mammal brains so the reptilian brain don't run history. The reptilian brain lately has been running everything. The rape of Mother Earth. The war on Mother Earth. The war on women. The war on women's bodies. That's not the mammal brain at work, folks. It's a distorted sense of masculinity. Where men are taught to identify with their reptilian brains. I win, you lose. Now, our third brain, which is very recent, a few hundred thousand years old, 
is the bomb. <laughs> it's the surprise. It's what makes every birth so difficult because our heads are so big, our neocortex. We can thank it because this is where our vast imagination and creativity and intelligence and reason uh, happens on the one hand. But of course, with these gifts of reason and intelligence and creativity and imagination, we can destroy the earth or we can learn to work together. In other words, we can couple the neocortex to the reptilian brain exclusively, which is planning for the next epic of militarism, or we can choose to decouple and connect it to our mammal brains, which is about loving one another, about treating ourselves as a family, all races, all religions, all genders, all the diversity that we can celebrate. A few years ago, I was invited to be on an island for a week with scientists, 150 scientists gather in this island every year to talk about religion and spirituality. And I gave a talk, and then there were panels and everything. And at one time in the panel, a scientist stood up. He was in the front or second row. He was from Pakistan. He was probably Muslim. And he said, what's your definition of meditation? And I said, well, for me, meditation is calming the reptilian brain. Because reptiles are not good at bonding, but they're very good at lying in the sun. Crocodiles lie in the sun. Snakes lie in the sun. Check it out. Scorpions like the sun. And that's solitude. And that's what meditation is about. The word monk, monos, comes from the word for solitude. So we all have a monk inside of us. And that's how you tame the reptilian brain. Nice crocodile, nice crocodile. Through meditation. Well, when I finished, he jumped up, the scientist jumped up, and he turned around to the crowd behind them. Did you hear that? He said, that's the best definition of meditation I've ever heard in my life. So I was combining what I learned from science with my understanding of meditation, and I had shared it with Rupert Sheldrake, this biologist who I know well. Is, am I right that, that uh, reptil reptiles are, are great on lying in the sun and solitude? They like their solitude. That means there's a monk in every reptile. So anyway, for me, that was very important that we have, again, from science, new ways of talking about and understanding why practices work. And here I want to bring attention to the latest book, two books, recent books by Rupert Sheldrake, my scientist friend from England, a biologist. One is called Ways to Go Beyond and Why They Work. And the other is called Science and Spiritual Practices. What he does here is just so wonderful. He goes through so many religious practices from pilgrimage to fasting, to chanting, to meditation. He even has a chapter on psychedelics and, and drugs like that. And um, what he shows is the scientific, why these things work. He goes into the science behind them. We who come out of religious traditions, we do them because it's in our tradition to fast. It's in our tradition to go on pilgrimage or to chant or to um, uh, do ritual. But um, he's getting to the science behind it. So here's a beautiful example, too, of how religion and science are coming together today. And at the University of Wisconsin, there's a whole department there that has been devoted now for 20 years. You're doing studies with uh, Buddhist monks meditating and so forth, trying to find out how this affects our physiology and why it affects it and how important that is. So this is one more example of science and spirituality getting together today. It's not either or anymore. We can continue to do our fasting and our pilgrimages and, and, and our chanting and all the rest, but now also science is on board, which means... We can take it to the larger community because the basis of these practices is not just um, doctrine. The basis is 
the practice itself works. And of course, the, the Eucharist is an amazing practice in Christianity. And of course, Eucharist means thank you. It's a Greek word for thank you. The gathering, the gathering to say thank you. That is what the essence of worship. Thomas Aquinas says the, the essence of religion is to give thanks. That's at the core of the virtue of religion. It's gratitude, supreme gratitude, he says. That's what real religion is. It is supreme gratitude. At a time in, when the earth, Mother Earth, is in such dire straits, uh, we need to hear about supreme gratitude. And I want to close with another connection between science and religion today. We haven't heard that much about. But Rupert Sheldrake and I, one of the books we wrote together is called The Physics of Angels. And um, we dialogue on angels. He as a scientist and me as a theologian. And we take three great theologians in the Christian church. The first is Dennis the Areopagite. I've talked to him already, 6th century. He wrote a lot about angels. And then we take Hildegard of Bingen in the 12th century, who wrote a lot about angels. And then Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, who wrote a lot about angels. And we have this dialogue. He is a scientist and me as a theologian. I want to tell you two things that blow my mind that I learned from Rupert Sheldrake about angels. First is, I never heard this before, that Charles Darwin developed the evolution theory with another scientist named Wallace. And together they presented back to back at the scientific gathering in London, their theory of evolution together, because they created it together. And then they worked together for years, but then they had breakup, a divorce. What was it about? Angels. That Darwin stuck to the notion of survival of the fittest and so forth. But Wallace said, it's impossible that the wonders on the earth could have happened, all of them. Just like uh, Weiler said in our time that I was quoting earlier, uh, just by trial and error. There must have been a guiding intelligence in developing what has occurred on Earth, including our own humanity and our eyes. And traditionally, we call these guiding intelligences angels. So that's what they split about. Now, everyone's heard of Darwin. No one's heard of Wallace, hardly. The story is not well known, but I think it's a stunning story. They're one of the founders. Now, one reason we haven't heard of Wallace is that his class, Darwin was the upper class. He knew how to handle the press. Wallace was not. He was lower class, but he was equally bright in terms of intelligence and scientific knowledge. And uh, that's why we've heard of, of Darwin. We haven't heard of Wallace. So that's one astounding message for me in this dialogue we have. But here's another, and I'll leave you with this. It's stunning. Rupert Sheldrake says, in the writings by Aquinas on angels, if you put in the word quanta instead of angel, you have today's postmodern quantum physics. That Aquinas is asking the very same questions we're asking in physics today about light, about the, the travel of light, how fast is light, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And how is it possible to have beings that are not physical beings that are still present and moving around? So that, that um, uh, teaching is, uh, is equally stunning. Let me just just uh, share with you this one, how he puts it. Um, Aquinas discusses how angels move from place to place. His reasoning has extraordinary parallels to both quantum and relativity theories. Angels are quantized. You get a whole angel or not at all. They move as units of action. The only way you can detect their presence is through action. They are quanta of action. This is just like Einstein's description of the movement of a photon of light. Although we, ex we as external observers can measure the speed of light from the point of view of the light itself, no time elapses as it travels. It doesn't get older, et cetera, et cetera. So I just think that this is really interesting 
uh, again, example of the marriage today of science and spirituality. And the only question is, has it come too late for our species? One of my deep meditations these days is on these so far 15 other hominid species that we have shared the planet with. We, we all know about Neanderthal. We heard about the denizens, very strong in the Philippine DNA. But now in Southeast Asia, especially, there's all kinds of new hominids that are showing up and also in Africa. We don't even have names for them all. And there will be more. We're discovering so much. But the bottom line is this, and the lesson is this, folks. Every one of our hominid cousins is extinct. They're gone. Yes, we carry their DNA, but they're gone. We are the last ones standing. That is a scientific truth to wake up our species, to begin a renaissance, a new view of seeing the world from a new view of nature, including our own nature, but also with the spiritual traditions on board that have practices that can calm our reptilian brains, that can nurture our mammal brains so that we might be compassionate, to make that new leap into human history, which is essential for our survival, that we live up to our divine natures. Parishanu defines spirituality as our true nobility. Our true nobility. This is what spirituality furnishes. Thank you. I look forward to our discussion. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Dr. Fox. So I've unmuted, I, I've allowed participants to unmute themselves. Maybe we want to start. I think there's a few questions in the chat. Maybe Father Augustine or Jerry. Father Augustine, you want to take the chat? Ah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Matthew Fox, for this wonderful, exciting presentation. I would say this was intellectually entertaining and spiritually enlightening and edifying as well. A brilliant and rare synthesis of science and spirituality from the cosmological point of view, neurological point of view, with insights from biology. I really enjoyed your input and certainly I believe this would be the impression of all our participants as well. To be, we have about 25 minutes for interaction with Professor Matthew Fox. Firstly, I will post the two questions we have received in the chat box. First one is from Odile Coirier. I am sorry if I'm not pronouncing it correctly. Thanks for your presentation. I have a question. As a Christian, how to reconcile the numerous names of God and the dogma of Trinity, God as Father? You got the question, Dr. Matthew? Sure. Interesting question. <laughs> um, all doctrines are meant to be played with. All doctrines are meant to be played with. All archetypes are meant to be played with. And so think of a doctrine as kind of like a sandbox where you play, you see. There's a parameter. There's a parameter around the sandbox. Otherwise, sand would be everywhere. <laughs> but um, so the, the doctrine provides a, a parameter, a structure, a form. But within that form, play. Use your imagination. Use your imagination of that's what art is, isn't it? The artists should be singing, creating songs and dance and music and movies around this powerful archetype of the Trinity. Now, Parashanu himself has a fresh naming of the Trinity. Continuous creation. That means the creator is always at work, first person of the Trinity, always at work. And of course, science is now backing that up, that 
Creation doesn't just sit there. It's not fixed. It's not done. It's expanding and is constantly living, dying, and being re- reborn. Second person of Trinity is continuous incarnation. The, the incarnation happened in history for Christians in Jesus, but not exclusively. We are all other Christs. And that was Jesus' basic message, calling us all to be other Christs. And not just all two-legged ones. Like Thomas Merton said, every non-two-legged creature is a saint. So um, all beings are other Christs. If you have a pet cat or dog or horse or tree or rock, those are other Christs. They will speak to you. The word. They are words of God. Meister Eckhart said that. Every creature is a word of God and a book about God. So every creature is a Bible, a book about God. Eckhart says, if I spent enough time with a caterpillar, I'd never have to prepare a sermon because a caterpillar is so full of God. And of course, there's so many lessons in a caterpillar. Of course, the butterfly, the dying, the kenosis, the via negativa, but then the rebirth, the via creativa, the resurrection of a butterfly, etc. Then the third member of the Trinity, if you will, that Shanu names, is this, and it found its way into the Vat- the Council of the Second Vatican Council in a very strong way. By the way, Shanu was invited to the Second Vatican Council not by a European bishop, but by an African bishop. The Bishop of Madagascar invited Shanu to be his theologian to come to the Second Vatican Council. And Shanu's influence has not been just the naming of creation spirituality, but Shanu is the father of liberation theology as well. Gustavo Gutierrez was a student of Shanu's, and he gave a talk just three years ago at the um, University of Tübingen entitled Liberation Theology, the Daughter of Père Chenou. Now, one reason that Chenou was so significant of Vatican II and then in Liberation Theology and is that he had a, he was in tune with Africa, with the colonized world, with the, the global south. And so his seeing of the world translated into the consciousness of South Americans, Latin Americans and other oppressed people, as it did the African uh, bishops. But the third part of the journey for Shnu is reading the signs of the times. That's what the Holy Spirit does with us, co-creates with us. Read the signs of the times. Shnu was writing about that in the 1930s. He created the menu for Vatican II in the 1960s. Reading the signs of the times. That's the Holy Spirit at work. So for us together here to read the signs of matricide and the killing of Mother Earth today. To read the signs of where has a sense of the sacred gone and how do we get it back. To read the signs of the reptilian brain being too successful, if you will, too investing too much in the reptilian brain and not enough in the mammal brain. All that is reading the science. Science is a sign of our times. No question about it. And so being in tune with today's science and bringing it together with our tradition and the Trinity is one good example of that. But you have to play with it. You don't squat on it with one version Nothing, everything, I've learned this about life after 83 years. Everything important in life is a metaphor. It's a metaphor. Love, death, sex, God, angels. Humans can't freeze words. For one thing, the word God is different. Is God in English, is Gott in German, is Dieu in French, is Dios in Spanish. It's, there's names for God all over the world. And of course, then we have different names for God in our religions. There's Allah, 
There's Wang Kang Tanka in Lakota language and in, in, in religion. There's um uh there's Christ, there's the goddess, there's Mary, there's Buddha, there's Brahman. There's no one way to name anything that's important. We have to get over that. That's what idolatry is. To zero in on one thing. So the same too with our archetypes that are so rich, like the Trinity. Long before Christians talked about a trinity, there were trinities in India. There's trinities among the Celtic people. If you ever go to Newgrange in Ireland, which is older than the pyramids, the front is three circles, three spirals, all carved into a big, big rock. It's a trinity. It's a trinity of life, death, and regeneration. So trinity is an archetype. Humans are always come up with trinities. And then there's your family. There's a father and a mother and a baby. Ah, that's another trinity. They're all holy. They all have something to tell us. And literalism kills. As Paul said, the liter letter kills, spirit gives life. So spirit and letter are not the same thing. We need letters. We need language. We need concepts. But we don't need to park on them and become fixated, we want to be creative with them and give birth to new generations of people. And that's where art comes in. Art, science, and spirituality. That's what cosmology is. It's not just scientists giving us the facts. That's not enough. We have to translate it into Playful language, that's the poet, that's art, that's music. We have to dance to it. That's that's what ritual is about. And we have to think it through and ask, what did they say in the past? What are we saying now? And that's the theologian's work. You are, um, I can't hear you. You're muted. Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank I you. haven't muted myself. Okay. The next one is mostly a comment from the African context. Mm -hmm. The renowned John Impiti talks of Africa, Africans being notoriously religious. It means that African life, culture, and beliefs are an organic system. One must not separate nature from belief. This reverberates very well with your view of creation. Fixing the ecological crisis would require this sort of a perspective. Maybe you wish to make a quick response. This is only a comment, uh, Professor. Beautiful, beautiful. I love that. Notoriously religious. Um, I'll tell you a story. Several years ago, there was an Australian theologian lecturing in Africa. And um, at the end, and he was being translated into Swahili. So he would speak a sentence or two and then be translated and go from there, English to Swahili, back and forth. Near the end of his lecture, he said, the number one spiritual problem in Sydney today is loneliness. With that, the translator paused and he huddled. And he said, well, would you repeat that sentence, please? I repeat it. The number one spiritual problem in Australia today is loneliness. Then he huddled with other Africans for a few minutes and he said, came to the microphone and said, I'm sorry, sir, but in our language, there is no word for loneliness. <laughs> I just love that story. I mean, take the top of your head off. What? No word for loneliness? We're, we're, we're masters at loneliness. The Western world is masters. Of, of course we are because we cut creation out. All we've been worrying about is whether we're going to go to hell or heaven. Redemption is everything and creation is nothing. So of course you're lonely. You don't give, give a damn about any, any other creature except yourself. You're going to be lonely. Pope Francis talks about that. Narcissism of our species. It's not natural. We all come from Africa. We invented loneliness. What do I mean by we? I mean the modern consciousness. Once you cut off your relationship to the whole, to the cosmos, for which we were made to connect to the cosmos, that's what all ritual is about. Once you've cut that off and you got all your, your prayers in a book, 
you're reading prayers instead of speaking them from your heart. It's one reason I love to pray with Native American people in sweat lodges and sun dances and vision quests. You don't take a book and do a sweat lodge. First of all, it's dark in there. Secondly, you'd ruin your book. It's wet in there, too. You bring your body and your heart in there, matter and spirit, and you pray with the rocks. They heat up the rocks, and you sweat. You pay a price. First time I was in a sweat lodge, I'll tell you this, first 20 minutes, I thought I was going to die there. I was looking for a fire escape or for a... For a, a um, fire extinguisher. And after 20 minutes, I said, I am going to die in here. And I yield to the experience. And you go to another place. And I've had so many powerful experiences in sweat lodges. I mean, visits from bed. Even my dog came and visited me once. My dead dog in the sweat lodge. And my father came and visited me. He was deceased. I mean, the spirits come. So, yes, the ancient peoples were connected to nature in a sacred way. You know, Father B. Griffith said to me once, I asked him, you know, what's the number one thing you learned from living in India? He said, the number one thing I've learned is that everything is sacred. Rivers and trees and places and rocks. So this is our inheritance. This is our ancestors, India and certainly Africa, our motherland, where we all come from. So um, we want to celebrate that. And, and that's why the Africans are still notoriously religious, because they haven't given up on creation. They haven't gone through that bubonic plague of the 14th century like Europeans did, and, uh, which killed creation spirituality, really. And, um, but again, it's coming back. When Pope Francis, Laudati Si, I did a, a long study on that from a point of view of Christian spirituality. It's, it's available on my website, MatthewFox.org. It's free. And I showed how he follows the four paths of Christian spirituality right there, the via positiva, negativa, creativa, transformativa. It's, it's pure Christian spirituality. And of course, his namesake, oh, uh, Francis of Assisi, was creation-centered, absolutely. You know, his greatest poem uh, brother Sun and Sister Moon doesn't mention Jesus once. Does that mean he's not Christian? No. He had a sense of the cosmic Christ who's present in all beings, including the sun and the moon and Sister Earth and the flowers and all the rest. So um, this is in our tradition, but the modern age killed it. And remember, the modern age is so anthropocentric, so so solipsistic, so narcissistic, to use Pope Francis's term. So this is where Africa and other indigenous um, memories and tribes bring so much to the Christian story. And that is one thing that's powerful about Christianity, is that it has sometimes adapted in a healthy way. But very often, no, it responded when the Europeans came to the Americas, of course. It was all about wiping out the indigenous mind, but um, it's coming back. And I, I've had the privilege of having Native Americans teaching on my faculty for, for years and years and, and being friends and inviting me into their practices. So um, uh, this is part of the gift of the world today, that the Native people in Africa, yeah, Americas and other places are still alive and well, uh, they've suffered a lot, but I mean, they're regaining their self-identity. Even the revelations about the horrible things done to children in schools in Canada and the United States, government schools and Christian schools, just that this is coming out. They were lancing the wound. We're telling the truth. This is the beginning of a new, of a new possibility. And of course, Creation is what we all have in common. There's no such thing, as I wrote in my Cosmic Christ book 30 years ago, no such thing as a Roman Catholic rainforest, a Buddhist ocean, a Hindu river, well, Ganges might be a Hindu river, but, um, but uh, and an atheist cornfield, or a Baptist sun or a Lutheran moon. Once our religions, and that means us, put ourselves in context again, 
of creation. You see, this is why creative spirit is important. Of the cosmos that birthed us and is birthing us, we set our religions in that context. We can all breathe again. And that our, our rituals flow and match the creativity of the universe, the dance, the color, the music, the song. This is what we try to do with our cosmic masses. You turn the Christian liturgy into an authentic um, experience. And we've done about 125 of these masses around North America in the last 25 years. And I tell you, I, I wish I had time to tell you some of the stories that of people responding to them. Atheists have been, had their hearts changed on the spot. We do grieving too. We don't just celebrate the joy of life, but we go into a grieving practice as well. And today, our species has to grieve. I say there are two kinds of people in the world, those who know they're grieving and those who don't know they're grieving. We're all grieving. We all know we're losing a lot in this world and we have lost a lot. So we have to deal with the grief. If we're going to empower ourselves to be birthers for a, uh, a, a, you know, a survival civilization, any survival um, compassion based uh, spirituality. And Dr. Fox, two more questions in our chat box. I will post them together for a of time. First one is about the, in the context of the reptilian brain that you discussed, our political leaders seem to be carried away by the reptilian brain. What can we do about this one? Second question is about atheism. What about the existence of atheists in the cosmic context this is raised in the context of the thousand names for God. So first one about the reptilian brain, our politicians being led by. Second about the existence of atheists. Well, one way to undermine the reptilian brain is to critique masculinity. Um, because I think there's some subtle connection between testosterone and the reptilian brain. Um, so I wrote a book several years ago on um, the, called The Hidden Spirituality of Men, 10 Metaphors to Awaken the Sacred Masculine. So we have to realize how sick the masculine has become. In my country, I'm sure many of you know about the number of young men who go to theaters, to churches, to synagogues, to public places with these awful military weapons and kill dozens of people or try to. That's um, perverse masculinity. And it's young men who do not have a sense of what manhood really means. So I go through my book, 10 archetypes of the sacred masculine. I'll just name a few. Father Sky. <clears throat> Getting Father Sky, but this is where cosmology comes in. You see that men for in the West for hundreds of years have been told the sky is dead, a machine, cold, inert. So men have not had a place to take their deepest passions, whether of love or of moral outrage. So we've been holding this anger inside, and it's violent. It comes up as violence. So recovering Father Sky, recovering the green man, which is an ancient archetype, pardon me, of humanity, a connection to the vegetable world, with a He's often depicted with a beard, and the beard is like a wreath covering the head, and in it are living things, birds or uh, grapes and such as that. So the whole archetype is about defending Mother Earth, becoming a spiritual warrior, which is another healthy male archetype, a uh, spiritual warrior, defending Mother Earth and defending uh, the poor and, and the oppressed. So... Um, and the blue man is another archetype, an archetype of compassion, our powers of healing and creativity. So that's how you deconstruct the excessive uh, and off-centered versions of masculinity that is, rightly is being pointed out, seen to make it to the top of most of our political systems. Um, and of course, the move in authoritarianism and fascism today, that is a father problem. It's a father problem. Hitler had a great problem with his father who beat him every day. That 
would turn Hitler's soul into wanting to beat someone else every day. And he chose the Jews and others. So, and homosexuals. So the qu second question was about, um, I'm sorry. Atheism. Atheism. In the atheism. Past. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, look at the word atheism. It's two Greek words. No. A is no in Greek. No theism. No theism. Theism says, I'm here and God's up there someplace, out in the sky someplace. And I have to call God in by prayer. I think that's a very tiny version of God. Panentheism is the mystical view of God. Panentheism. See, there are four ways to understand our, our relationship to God. Theism, atheism. Theism, which is rejection of theism. Pantheism, which says everything is God, and God is everything. And then panentheism, which is perfectly orthodox, and says everything is in God, and God is in everything. That's the mystical way of seeing the world. And um, because it's about the intimacy and imminence of divinity, but it also leaves room for the transcendence and the surprise of divinity. Panentheism, everything in God, God is in everything. It's not the same as everything is God, because that limits God to what is. And that couldn't be, because before isness, there was the maker of isness, if you will. That's this way I see it. So um, that's one issue with atheism. That atheists have not heard about panentheism. They haven't heard about um, about mysticism, and yet many atheists are mystical. And I'll tell you, I I was invited to do a sermon, two sermons actually, at a UU church just before um, COVID, three or four years ago, and my book on the names of God had just come out. And um, when I finished giving these names, and I probably throughout about 20 or 25. I said, um, now if there are any atheists here, I want to speak to you and I want to say this to you. Don't be a dumb atheist. Don't be a stupid atheist. Be a smart atheist. Don't spend your energy rejecting an 18th century version of God. Spend your energy rejecting these 21st century versions of God, which are, of course, very, very ancient, but I'm articulating them. Well, that was the first service. And between the services, I, there was a break, and I was signing books. And a man came up. He was about 41 years old. He said, I came to church an atheist this morning, and I'm not an atheist any longer. I said, really? After a 25-minute sermon, you gave up your atheism? You weren't a very devoted atheist, were you? <laughs> well, he said, when you said, don't be a stupid atheist, it was like a bullseye hitting me. I spent my whole life rejecting an 18th century version of God. <laughs> well, you're talking about, I've never even thought about before. He signed my book, he said. So I signed his book and he walked away. So um, that's uh, that was one experience of I had with a contemporary atheist. And I mentioned the other one that happened recently. But here's a third, and I'll be, and then I'll shut up. But um, at our cosmic mass, we did a cosmic mass for a thousand people at the Sounds True Conference in the uh, mountains outside uh, in Colorado. It's an annual retreat they have for a week, and I was invited to bring the Cosmic Mass. And there there were Jewish rabbis, there were Hindus, there were Sufis, there were uh, Christians and, and Jews, of course, and um, some atheists. And afterwards, a woman came up to me. She said, I'm an atheist. I'm a fierce atheist. I'm such a fierce atheist that when I walk down the street and there's a church, I cross the street to go by the church. I said, well, that's kind of fierce. But she said, when we did that grieving experience, and she hit her chest like that, pointing to her heart, she said, something shifted inside of me. And by the time communion came along, she said, I was hungry for it. I had to have some. She said, my whole life has changed here tonight. I don't know what's going to happen next, but I'm not an atheist anymore. So I'm just pointing out that um, a lot of atheists are atheists for good reason. They're anti-theist, they're anti-religion, because religion often causes more war than peace, if you haven't noticed. And uh, so 
there's a difference. You know, realize that atheists come as diverse as believers do. You just say they're Hindu believers or Lutheran believers or Baptist believers. Though there are atheists come, they all, we all have our stories to tell, don't we? And so um, don't count the atheists out. Now, some atheists, some, we've made a lot of money lately up in England because they come out, you know, hitting you over the head. Uh, but most of it is to make money. Uh, Rupert Sheldrake, my friend, debates these atheists. And he says a lot of them aren't in it for the intellectual exchange. They're in it because they're making a lot of money. So he's not impressed with some of these money-making atheists. But um, he thinks they're, they're pseudo-atheists. <laughs> they don't even know the God they're, they're rejecting. And that's what okay. true believers should provide. A, a compassionate God is hard to reject. Thank you, Dr. Fox. It was really inspirational. Thank you, uh, Professor Fox. Thank you, all the people who came to our event. We're excited to have uh, Dr. Fox as part of our GMU family. And uh, we hope you'll consider another time uh, to come back. This was a very wonderful opportunity to hear his talk, and we hope that you will all return uh, to GMU for other events that we have in the future. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Namaste. 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 Bye. Thank you too. Bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Big thanks. Bye. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you, Professor Matthew. Bye-bye.